Here's a photo of a classical pianist playing, of course by memory, in front of a quiet audience. He's playing a work by Franz Liszt, seen here playing from a score in front of a chatty, noisy audience. Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. So, I was recently watching a two-set violin video that I recommend you check out. They talk about many other topics not related to what I'm going to talk about, but a portion of that video referred to classical musicians feeling a lot of anxiety and constriction around some of the things that are expected today out of classical musicians. And when I saw that, it inspired me to do some research as to where some of the customs and traditions and things that we take for granted are how we have to do things, where do these things come from? Is it something that we're doing now or is it something that came from the time of Beethoven. So for this research I read a really interesting article and book that I will link below, check them out, and I'm gonna divide this video into two parts. First, some of the things that are expected out of classical musicians, out of performers, and whether that was always the case, and second, some of the things that are expected out of the audience and the classical concert and its whole. So I'm gonna go back in time and see whether this was always like this or not, and spoiler alert, it was not, it was not always like this. So like I mentioned, for solo players, not orchestra members, even not conductors, it is very, it is required of soloists that they know the pieces by memory. This was not at all what Beethoven, Chopin, Liszt, or any of those composers wanted or did in their time. Beethoven used to say that if you didn't have a score, you would lose the capability of sight reading and you would be too focused on memorizing it to actually focus on making music, on articulation, on expression. Chopin was pissed off at one of his own students when the student came to his class with one of the Chopin's Nocturnes memorized and he said, I don't want any of this, are you reciting a lesson? But mostly the reason why there was not a score in play is because at the time classical musicians would sometimes improvise a lot, which is something that we really stopped doing. So Liszt, the famous virtuoso pianist, might give a concert where he would play his pieces or someone else's, but he would also improvise. And so what this meant is that if you had a score, you were playing someone else's piece. And if you didn't have a score, you were improvising. And so playing someone else's piece without a score meant that you weren't taking it seriously, that you were gonna freestyle a Beethoven piece. But having said that, there are accounts of Liszt adding harmonies to even Beethoven pieces, and there's articles in the press back then saying that, you know, it worked really nicely. So even with pieces that were from other composers, they did take some liberties. So what changed was that gradually improvisation stopped being a thing, and so this distinction disappeared. But the biggest negative of this, aside from the pressure put on the soloist that you might argue is for no good reason, I mean, don't get me wrong, if you want to memorize a piece, I enjoy memorizing the stuff I conduct. Sometimes I don't have time, sometimes I do, and I prefer it because I am freer to make more visual contact, but it shouldn't be something that creates an extra amount of stress. There's accounts from the famous pianist Rubinstein saying at the end of his life that he was terrified to go on stage because he could feel his memory going and he didn't want to have a score because it was frowned upon, which is ridiculous. And moreover, another consequence of the trend of doing things about memory is that the repertoire shrinks because you cannot possibly memorize a million pieces and so you pick the ones that you think are more often gonna come in your career so that you work hard on something that you will use many times. And another little thing I want to mention is around the topic of perfection, of not playing any wrong notes. We are so haunted by the notion of playing a wrong note or something out of tune that, you know, it creates real stress. And I am not saying, of course, you should practice and try and get your technique as good as possible so you're confident in your tools and you can express the music 100%. But there are accounts of some well-respected artists in the 1800s who would make a lot of mistakes and people would not prioritize that 
as much as the musical ideas that they brought to the table. There is an account of famous pianist Claudio Arrau seeing a concert from a composer slash pianist of the time who was known for not putting that much time into perfection because he liked to compose and would split his time. But the reviews that Arrau made of his playing were really interesting. I'm gonna put it here, but he said he made a ton of mistakes, but I was so impressed with the musical ideas, meaning, yes, you're not, you, you're not gonna ignore the fact that it wasn't technically perfect, but you shouldn't also ignore the fact that there were really nice expressive ideas or it communicated a lot of emotion. And of course, because Liszt was a legend, there is a lot of accounts of Liszt improvising chords and missing by a semitone and just like winking at the audience and incorporating that as he went down the scales. He just laughed it off. This changed a lot when recording starting to happen because performances would be recorded one, two, three, four times so that they would be perfect before they were put in a CD or vinyl. And of course that raised the stakes and now, you know, making mistakes or playing row notes is like going to hell. But it's good to remember that this was not always prioritized as highly as we might prioritize it today. And the second thing I want to talk about is the concert itself, the etiquette, the things that we know we have to do when we go to a concert as an audience member. The one thing that's always discussed is the applause, 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 we live for the applause. Nowadays, the rule is... And don't applaud when she stops playing the first time, it's not over yet. <laughs> I'm first going to tell you about how this used to be and then I'm gonna contradict myself completely. But in the first half of the 1800s, the applause was something that the musicians wanted because it helped them know what things worked, especially if it was performance slash composer. So if Liszt would play a theme and variations, he would listen to the applause after every single variation and think, oh, well, this one worked, this one sucked, and made changes. Beethoven is quoted as saying, silence is not what an artist wish, what we want is applause. And there's many accounts of musicians saying that they wanted the applause to measure success. And like I said, after every movement, after they played a difficult cadenza, not all the way in the end. Now this is quite the topic because if this had gone on, if, if people had just applauded cheerfully wherever they wanted, there's a lot of more modern pieces from, I don't know, the early 1900s, Debussy's uh, Fond Prelude, who which would have not really existed because, you know, Debussy's Prelude uh, starts with like this flute really soft and if you had people clapping because they liked the flute player, you would not have heard it. So in a way, the audiences being more quiet allowed music to be a little bit more, um, to explore more, more dynamics. But I also really don't like the fact that some people might feel deterred from going into a classical music concert because they don't know where they should clap and they don't want to feel uncomfortable. And of course, nobody wants to feel uncomfortable and you shouldn't feel uncomfortable because you enjoy something, you appreciate it and you feel like clapping. That's something that we do. We agree that when you like something, you clap as a society. And so in a way, I don't know. I mean, what are your thoughts on this? I personally struggle with it, but I would want more people to come and feel like they can appreciate the musicians without feeling embarrassed if it's at the wrong time. Is this okay? Can I do this? And the last thing to say about this is that, like I showed you on that depiction, people would go to concerts and chat and meet with someone and have a drink and then listen to the music a bit and then talk some more. And going back to Liszt, he would talk to the people between each movement instead of just leaving and coming back like we do now. He would, yeah, chit chat. He had this urn where people would put some suggestions so that he would improvise around them, kind of like a whose line is it anyways of classical music. So what I'm trying to say is that concerts used to be much more about a back and forth between the audience and, and the music and the whole experience. So for some final thoughts, I was watching that two set violin video and I want to say that they actually discuss a lot of topics around mental health, 
which have nothing to do with what I am talking here because mental health is something that you can struggle with irregardless whether your environment or the rules around you are good or bad. It's a completely different topic. And if you're interested in that, do check out their video. But the part where they were discussing feeling much freer when they were younger and then gradually feeling more constricted by these rules that we have in the classical music world, if you will, made me feel really sad in a way because I know for a fact that classical musicians, we go into this profession because we love this music so much and we also understand the value that it has for a society to be putting this music out there, the amount of reflection, empathy, thought, feelings that it can create in the person listening to it. And so the fact that we go into it with such a drive to be creative and expressive and end up feeling somewhat constricted and sort of stifled by some of this maybe traditions or things that we think we have to adhere to is quite contradictory and, you know, not ideal. And so I wanted to make this video and historically have a look at how we got here and pretty much just understand that what we do now, it's a modern construction that we develop over time. It's not us paying tribute to Beethoven because Beethoven is quoted as saying that playing a wrong note is forgivable, but playing without passion is inexcusable. And so we have to come up with different ideas in how we can make the concert experience better for everybody involved, better for us as classical musicians, that we feel more freedom to communicate these ideals and these feelings rather than to achieve technical perfection. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't practice, that you shouldn't make your technique as good as possible because that is what will give you the tools to communicate. But I guess what I'm saying is that the setting of the priorities might be a little bit skewed. Okay, so this video is by no means a black and white band-aid solution. It's just a opening up of a conversation. And of course, I would love to hear from you guys, whether you are a classical musician or a person that goes to concerts or a person that never went to a concert, please write in the comments. It's important to have conversations, respectful conversations, I may add. And thank you to Two Set for making that video because I, I know that a lot of people resonated with it. I saw my feed full of people sharing it because they felt very related to a lot of the things that um, you guys were sharing. So that's great. And this is my humble take or, you know, a response or just adding to the conversations that we all should be having. So I hope you liked the video and I will see you next time.